Thank you, John. Thank you all for joining us today. There are a few conservatives who understand the American left better than David Horowitz, and that's because he was one of them. He had not just any rank-and-file progressive, but a founder of the New Left in the 1960s and an editor of the magazine Ramparts. And as a result, David brings to us a unique perspective about the progressive left that is vital to understanding the political debates that are playing out in America today. Uh, if conservatives are going to achieve policy victories in the future, we certainly need to recognize the challenges that we face, and David will help us do that today. On top of that list, of course, is the American left. And David has chronicled in a number of books, uh, the progressive left and American politics, including works like Destructive Generation, Radical Son, Art of Political War, and Indoctrination U. These books and others have... Uh, traced David's own ideological odyssey from the left to the right, and have uh, provided a blueprint for winning on the political battlefield. In 1988, he created the Center for the Study of Popular Culture, which was later renamed the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Its mis mission is to defend the principles of individual freedom, the rule of law, private property, and limited government, not unlike the Heritage Foundation. It also defends free societies in the war against their enemies and tries to reestablish the academic freedom in American schools. David's team oversees two very important projects, frontpagemagazine.com and Discover the Networks, an encyclopedia of the political left and its networks. David is joining us to talk about his new book, the Black Book of the American Left. It is the first of his 12-volume 12 bo 12 collected writings. This book reflects on his years associated with the left and the radical figures that he collaborated with at the time. Please join me in welcoming David Horowitz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back at Heritage, a great conservative institution. Uh, ever since I uh, came into the right and observed a political scene from a different vantage. It's always impressed me that whenever I see a, or usually see a conservative and a leftist or a progressive or a Democrat uh, and a Republican squaring off, it's something like uh, Godzilla versus Bambi. We, they call us racists, sexists, homophobes, imperialists, and we call them liberals. <laughs> what are these people liberal about except hard drugs and sex and spending other people's money uh, and giving criminals the third and fourth and 15th chance? They're bigoted people, and that's be because they're so self-righteous. They're unscrupulous. They're shameless. And the last thing they are is tolerant. My parents were card-carrying members of the American Communist Party. Um, and therefore, they were part of what was actually a vast conspiracy orchestrated from Moscow and dedicated to the overthrow of the whole American system and its replacement with a Soviet America. Of course, they called themselves progressives. That's the way they were. I never heard my parents refer to themselves as communists. Um, <clears throat> progressives. Uh, liberals came much later, uh, but it's back to progressives now. This book uh, represents, it's the first of ten volumes. It, it, it appears that I've written over a million, well, a million and a half words, and they all are about the same thing. They're all about the political left. When I came into the right, I saw that conservatives do many things really well. Conservatives understand the founding. They understand the economy. Um, this institution in particular does policy well, but there are quite a few policy tanks. Um, my center is not a think tank. It's a battle tank. What conservatives and Republicans don't do well is to fight the dedicated enemies of the system that has given us all the blessings that it has. And this book... Um, and the books that will follow, uh, I felt were worth putting together because they, they're they about this left in a way that no other book is or will be. I mean, it took, uh, you know, I, I dread to give, uh, I shouldn't give my, my enemies, although they, they prefer to ignore us, um, 
ammunition, but it's it's monomaniacal in this sense. It's it's I, I write in the introduction. Um, there was a famous, uh, uh, I guess it's just a, a fragment from Archilochus, the Greek philosopher, that there are hedgehogs and foxes, and uh, the foxes know many things, and the hedgehogs know one thing. Well, I am a hedgehog. Um, the it's very important to understand the mentality of the left because in politics, as you know, I mean, the, 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 probably the principal cause of distress in human affairs is the fact that people lie. Everybody lies. Some people make little lies. Some people make very big lies. We have a compulsive, habitual, and the most brazen liar in our history in the White House today. Um, but that... Can, that definitely messes with your head when you're trying to think about who you're facing uh, and what to do about it. So as I say, my parents called themselves progressives. Um, when I was young, Stalin was alive. The slogan of the American, the agenda of the American Communist Party was a Soviet America and doing everything in their power to make America lose the Cold War and the Soviet Union and its system spread worldwide. That, that was their, that, that's what they were about. But the slogan of the Communist Party in those days was peace, jobs, and democracy. Heard that before? Um, so I can tell you from the, well, I've, I've been at politics. I marched in my first May Day parade when I was nine. That was 1948. So all those years, the communist left, the left that I was born to, has gravitated into the Democratic Party and is the Democratic Party today. Um, should be obvious, shouldn't it? Valerie Jarrett, David Axelrod, the two key presidential advisors who, who shaped Obama's whole political career, were born into the communist left. Like Obama, who was born into the communist left, trained in the communist left, uh, graduated to the communist new left. There was no new left. That, that's what the 60s should have showed everybody. Um, when I realized that, that's, that's when I got out. I always thought, I, when I was in the left, when I described myself as a Marxist revolutionary, I mean, I was critical of the Viet Cong. I mean, I, 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 by the way, I despised Billy Ayers when I was a Marxist revolutionary because he was a rich, snot-nosed, irresponsible twit and an ignoramus, which he remains today. But that didn't prevent me from working to undermine this country and to cause it to lose the Vietnam War or to, to really to betray the Vietnamese is what we did. Um... And I, I, I'm going to do this really quickly. People will say, oh, Horowitz is a relic. He's an extreme. I mean, using language like this. Um, but, but this is the reality of the mentality. Take, for example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And, and of course, our whole perspective, even those on the right, is, is skewed by the fact that our culture is so dominated by leftists. Or, you know, our, our press, the definers of our language. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a left-wing ideologue extremist. That's what she is. There were four Republican votes against her confirmation, four. She was waltzed into the chamber by Orrin Hatch, uh, but got the endorsement of the Republican Party. Uh, not too long ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg gave an interview. It's when the Muslim Brotherhood was still ruling Egypt, or had just come into power. Now, what the Obama administration has done, which is to be a shill for the Brotherhood, would be tantamount to Franklin Roosevelt uh, aiding Hitler's rise to power, sending him, whether well, they didn't have jets in those days, an air force, and a billion dollars in aid. That's what the Obama administration has done. But not only is the left, and I, by that I mean the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC, NBC covering for him. But even conservatives 
are uh, they're tongue tied in talking about this administration the way it needs to be talked about. And the reason is that conservatives mind their reputations and they understand that if they do talk like that, um, they'll be pushed or put, portrayed as on the extreme and so forth. Ruth Gader, Bader Ginsburg was uh, interviewed and uh, about uh, Egypt's going to get a constitution. Well, if the Muslim Brotherhood is running Egypt, what's the constitution? What's the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood? The Koran is my constitution. So it, it, it's all lies. And, and of course, Hillary, the idea that Hillary could be regarded as a prospect for president when she's done what she's done as Secretary of State is mind-boggling. We live in a surreal world, is what that means. So anyway, she said, uh, in re- recommending a constitution to the people who already have one, which was written in the, whatever, the seventh century and hasn't evolved an inch since then, was, well, the American, don't use the American Constitution, it's old. This is the way they think. It's old. It's just a piece of paper that was written 250 years ago, has had obviously no influence on the prosperity and freedoms that we enjoy, I guess. It's old. We need a living Constitution. They hate the Constitution. Why? Because Madison designed it to thwart the left. It's right there in Federalist 10. Redistribution is communism. And he said it was designed to thwart wicked projects like redistribution of income and taking away property. The uh, American Constitution is old, she said. Try the South African Constitution. I was in South Africa when Mandela, Mandela was released. I interviewed the left there. Their mentality, and that is the ANC, which is won by the South African Communist Party, which are the designers of the Constitution. Their mentality was Stalinist in the 30s. And I, you know, I, as a leftist, I'm well aware of the gradations and the, the little revisions and so forth that go on through time. What is the South African? It's, it's like the Stalin Constitution, the 1936 Soviet Constitution. It's all about your right to this and your right to that. You have a right to an environment free of violence. It's what Madison called, he called them parchment rights, but for people who don't, don't get what parchment is, paper rights, they're meaningless. South Africa has seven times, seven times the murder rate as the United States. It's the rape capital of the world. And a typical of the left to... Uh, conduct this, the international divestment of South Africa, topple what was actually uh, the de Klerk regime, was, a, was it's the regime that freed Mandela and could have plotted a, a decent future for this country. But no, the American left decided to blow up the South African regime, put the communists in power, and then forgot about it just the way they forgot about the Vietnamese when they were being slaughtered by the communists. I've, I've compared the, in, in Gatsby, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, described, the way he describes the rich is they, they break things and leave other people to clean up their messes. That is a perfect description of progressivism. Okay, so the Constitution, it's all these phony rights. Um, and then it's... There's actually a phrase in the Constitution. I'm going to quote this. You won't believe that it's there, but it is. Discrimination is unfair unless it is established that it's fair. <laughs> Swear to God, that, that Orwellian phrase. <laughs> and property rights, oh, you, what, the, the Constitution protects property rights, which can only be, property can only be expro- expropriated, they use the Marxist term, expropriated, if it can be shown that this will be a universal good. So it's a communist constitution. Now, it's not, it's not just that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, this left-wing extremist ideologue who's portrayed as some kind of a liberal moderate by us as well as by them. Not only that she uh, in, endorses this communist constitution and prefers it to ours, This is the battle in the world today, people. Not only does she do that, 
But what do her so-called liberal colleagues do? Is there a dissent? Did the other communists on the Supreme Court, Kagan and Sotomayor, say anything? Well, of course, Sotomayor wasn't, they weren't there yet. But have they said anything? No. Breyer? No. Any Democrat? No. What does that tell you? I mean, you can call it the popular front. You know, I don't care. They're communists and they're fellow travelers and dupes. But the mentality of the Democratic Party today is a communist mentality. The left has learned, they learned from the 60s. In the 60s, we said, we, we actually were rebelling against our parents who pretended to be Jeffersonian Democrats. That's what they said when they were called, be, when they were in court, when they were called before hearings, they're Jeffersonian Democrats. No, they're not. They're Marxist communists. That's who they are. We in the 60s didn't want to pretend that. Remember Jerry Rubin showed up at the HUAC committee hearing dressed as an American revolutionary. We're revolution. We want a revolution and we want it now. That's what we said. And that was actually very decent of us because it warned people what we were about. And that's one big reason why the 60s failed in the 60s and has succeeded uh, in the last decade in taking power in this country. That's what this is about. This is the triumph of the 60s, which is the triumph of the communist left in America. All right. I want, I want to just say one other thing. You'll say, well, they're not communists because they're not putting people in the gulag or suppressing their free speech. Well, that's because they can't yet. I conducted a quixotic campaign on American campuses. I based my entire, it was for an academic bill of rights for students. I based the entire campaign on the 1915 AAUP, American Association of Universities Professors, famous classic statement on academic freedom. And all it said was that students should be presented when there's a controversial issue, which is the entire liberal arts division, that's all it's about is controversial issues. There should be two sides presented, at least, fairly, and the students should be left to make up their own minds, and they should have required readings on both sides. That's all I said. I was pilloried from one end of the country to the other by the AAUP uh, and by the AFT and by Democrats. And I had pitiful support from Republicans. The universities today, a conservative on a faculty is as rare as a unicorn. Well, there are Actually, there are some. But two or three, five, maybe. And they're all, of course, uh, subject to punishments if they um, are vocal and active conservatives. So most of them are not. Is there a protest from the liberal house about the suppression, about the one-party system that's been imposed on our universities, not to mention the student newspapers? No. So they are, 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 are revealing their true agendas to the point that they think they're able to. And, of course, the mentor of the entire left today, Saul Alinsky, that is the message of his book. Don't telegraph your agendas. The 60s made a big mistake. They didn't lie about what they wanted. We lied about a lot of other things, but we didn't lie about what we, what we wanted. Don't make that mistake. That's, that's Alinsky's book. You do what you can. So, you got Obamacare. You sell that. You say you want to uh, cover the uninsured. The one thing it's not going to do is cover the uninsured. But everything else about it is a lie, too. They've lied about everything. Because the true agenda is to create a... They really want a single payer. We know that. Why do we enable them by calling it single payer? It's communism. Is it not? The state is your health care provider. The state. They can take it away. If somebody who provides it can take it away. What's freedom? What freedom do we have left if the state controls our health? 
That's what it's about. That's why they have risked everything. If there's a God that intervenes in history, they're going to go down big time in this next election. It will be a tsunami that will drown that party for a generation. But that, that's only if there's a God who intervenes in history. <laughs> so, there are four features of the leftist mentality. You know, even Khrushchev was critical of Stalin at a certain point after Stalin was dead. Um, <laughs> you know, it doesn't take anything to, for a leftist to say, they, you know, they'll say, down with communism. We are democratic socialists. Yeah. The, um, the first characteristic, the first thing that divides, and this is the fundamental divide of our century and of, of the last century and of the modern age, really, is that people on the left are all Rousseauians. Rousseau famously or infamously said that man is born free but is everywhere in chains. Society did it. That's, that's basically the message there. That people in a state of nature, they get along, they are not greedy, they don't lie, they're not vain, they're not driven by their ego. I mean, this is such a crock. I mean, how could anybody believe this? But any, everybody on the left basically does. Basically does. That's why they think government can solve problems. Government. Government, the creator of slavery, segregation, wars, whatever. Why, why can government... How can people... You, you take these the people who are lying and stealing and cheating and oppressing. And you give them lots of power, and they're going to they're gonna fix everything. No, they're not. They're going to go on being who they were when they weren't in power. Only much, 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 much worse. And that's what we see, you know, before us. Conservatives understand that the root cause of social problems is us. We're the problem. That's why it's never been solved. We are the problem. And therefore they devised, uh, the brilliant founders devised a system to check us and make it really difficult to change things and really difficult to tyrannize over our fellows. That's what the system is about. That's why the rights are all negative. They're things that government can't do to you. Because your basic rights are not given by government, but they're given by your creator. Now, if you believe that social institutions are the source of the problems, and that if you change social institutions, you can change people. Even Hillary Clinton said we have to redefine what it means to be human in the 21st century. That is communism, people. That pure and simple. That is what drives them. That's the core belief. If we get enough power and change social institutions, we can create new men and new women and they're all going to get along and everything is going to be just peachy. That is the mentality of the Democratic Party today and there are no dissenters in that party. None. Zippo. That's who we're facing. The second thing, to know about the left. And they like the term progressive because they believe that history is a forward march. Things are getting better and better. Now there are setbacks, but it's moving forward. Barack Obama put a, placed a carpet in the Oval Office, which has an inscription. The moral arc of the universe is bent towards justice. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Is there a worse century in human history than the 20th century from the point of view of the slaughter of human beings, the genocides, the slave labor camps, and, and the oppressions? And the 21st century, if we don't stop these people, is going to be a lot worse. It's the first thing I said when Obama got elected the second time. A lot of people are going to die because of this election. 
And unfortunately, it's proving to be true. And we'll be, you know, if they had conducted that deal with the Iranians, truer too, true, truer still. Um, so progressives believe that there's a happy future. And in fact, and their, and their minds are focused that way. It's a complete contrast to conservatives. Conservatives are what used to be normal in this country. The founders were conservatives. Even the the idea um, is in the, their their view of history was such that they're focused. Conservatives generally, of course, are focused on the past. That is, on learning from the past. This is what human beings have been like for three thousand years. Democracies have been tried, monarchies have been tried, aristocracies have been tried, and these are the problems. And they didn't think that democracy was a big solution. They thought, like Churchill, it's the worst system except for all the rest. And they, they, and they were very conscious of the flaws of preceding democracies, which is why they instituted the checks and balances. So conservatives are pragmatists, and that's why they were, they were so hungry for deals, you know, my message to Republicans, don't make any deals that help the Democrats and Obama for the next year, please. You can, you can make deals when you are in the driver's seat. Don't make deals from weakness. Progressives are focused on the future. And what's the chief characteristic of the future? It's imaginary. It's never the future they are focused on never existed in human history and as conservatives, we understand it can never exist. It's an impossible dream and a very, very destructive one, as we know from the history of progressive movements in the 20th century, which killed 100 million people in peacetime. Hitler killed them in wars. He killed plenty in peace, but he didn't kill 100 million people. It took a progressive to do that. It is a, as I've said in many places, a crypto religion. The world is a fallen place. And we're going to save it. This is what makes them so dangerous. They see themselves as a savior. A, a decent, I would say, I would say authentic, but an authentic religion says the world is a really screwed up place. And human beings are incapable of unscrewing it. But when we die, we, I, you know, you have a faith. You, don't, you can't know you have a faith. My friend Christopher Hitchens could not know there was no God. That's just his religious faith. But a true religionist has the faith that it will all be sorted out on the other side when we see face to face. That's the only kind of redemption or belief in redemption that I can respect. People who believe the redemption will take place in this life and they're going to be part of it, that's the Hitlers, that's the Lenins, that's the Maos. And unfortunately, it is the ideology, moderated, of course, but the ideology, I mean, moderated for the American framework of the Democratic Party and the progressive left. If we have the power, we can do it. So if you believe that, as I said, that social institutions can change things by changing, getting enough power, then when you look at uh, your opponents, who are the people who are not going along with the program? You see yourself as the army of the saints. Who are they? They're the party of Satan. You are the party of Satan. If you want to understand a so-called liberal, just think of a hellfire and damnation preacher and, and his mentality. That's what it is. That's why they're rude. They're always interrupting. That's why it doesn't bother them in the least that there are no conservatives on their faculties. Because conservatives are evil. They're spreading ideas that are evil, that are keeping people from enjoying this paradise on earth that they're going to bring about. Third characteristic is their uh, alienation from this country. And that leads to their, what I uh, generously call uncertain loyalties. We're the problem. America's the problem. What weakens America is actually good. 
You can't understand Obama's policies without understanding that. But we're complicit. Obama paid no attention, really, to the, uh, well, conservatives will understand this phrase, but Obama should not have used it in a presidential debate before 70 million people. He didn't care about the status of forces agreement. That is, we spent a trillion dollars, we lost thousands of lives to keep Iraq out of the Islamo-fascist hands, and Obama just kissed it all goodbye. We didn't. We don't have a troop there. We don't have a base there. And anybody hear the apologies from all the Democrats and leftists who said it was about blood for oil? Uh, what oil did we get? The, the Chinese got the oil. America is a patsy. That's basically. But Obama betrayed every American that gave their life for the people of Iraq. Every one of them. And not a single Republican said anything. Accused him of that betrayal. It, Repub- and it's not, look, it's not just Republicans. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of people probably here who think of themselves as conservatives rather than Republicans. Well, what did conservatives do? Where's the conservative screed on that? There is none. There is none. I mean, w- waking up a little bit over Benghazi. It's the most shameful act in the history of the American presidency. It's, it's so un-American. It's, it's beyond politics. Americans don't leave their dead on the battlefield. They certainly don't abandon uh, American heroes. These were Navy SEALs who served Obama. You don't hang up the phone and forget about them when they're fighting for their lives for the next seven hours. But he did. He did. And so did Hillary. And the fourth, all right, the, four, the fourth characteristic, of course, is that they lie. And it's not like politicians spinning. It's not a lie to cover up uh, that you were having sex with an intern in the White House. That's not the lies I'm talking about. You cannot be a leftist without lying. And lying about the most basic strategic facts of who you are. Leftists may be deluded, well, they are delusional because they believe in this social justice at the end of the rainbow, um, the kingdom of heaven on earth that they're going to bring about. I mean, how arrogant is that? Um, But they're they're, they're delusional, but they're not stupid, which is why my parents call themselves progressives. And my mother, of course, was a registered Democrat. Why do you call yourself progressive? It's the same reason that, uh, now, I don't want to upset anybody who is a true believing libertarian, but a lot of people say I'm a libertarian rather than a Republican, particularly in Hollywood. (laughs) It's safer. You cannot telegraph your agendas. If, 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 you know, I'm sitting there with a, of course, I have. I, I'm, I'm like Tiresias, I guess, who was, you know, he spent seven years as a woman, so everybody was always coming to him for advice. Um, I see Nancy Pelosi when Obamacare uh, was passed, beaming and saying, you know, first we did was I, I guess it was first with Social Security, and my conservative mind says bankrupt. And then she goes, and then Medicare, bankrupt. And now we're going to triple or quadruple down. I mean, you never never know that all those figures they put out in the beginning are lies. It's probably ten times what they say it's going to cost. How can you be so delusional? Because in her mind, these are just building blocks of a socialist America. That's what it's about. That's the agenda of Obamacare. I never thought I would live to see the day when I would say that we, we are on the... Uh, I don't want to make this overly dramatic, but we're within reach of a totalitarian state in this country. If you are prepared to use the IRS to punish your political opponents, and trust me, I mean, when the Clintons were in power, they were doing it too, but not only 
is Obama behind that, but he's promoted everybody that's involved in it. If you are willing to use the IRS to punish your opponents, if you have a health care system which controls, controls, that's what it's about, the services that you provide to people to save their lives and the lives of their loved ones, and you have a spy agency that knows everything that's going on, you don't need a secret police to destroy any opponent. It's right there at his fingertips. And obviously, he doesn't care, or he does care, he's going to, he's protecting it. Who has he fired? How do you understand this mentality except that this is a communist in the White House? Somebody who was brought up by communists, trained by communists. Stanley Kurtz has written an absolutely definitive book on Obama's history as a radical and his training and his mentality. You can't understand it any other way and the people around him. But what's truly frightening is that the Democratic Party is on board for this. And I understand there's all kinds of self-interest for people running for office and so forth. And then you have the Soros, who has put together a coalition of the true communist left, like the new mayor of New York, elected by the Workers' Families Party, which is a Hillary supporter. Richard Poe and I wrote a book called The Shadow Party, which has all this you know, in there. It was written years ago. Um, Soros has put together a powerful political co- and co- uh, coalition financially that goes from the the Occupy Wall Street wo- left. These Occupy Wall Street lunatics are creatures of the Obama administration, the Center for American Progress, the SCIU, the communist unions. We're in trouble. As a country, these are very, very dark days for this country. Now, not to, I'm, I'm going to conclude here, but not to depress you all. <laughs> There's been a uh, an earthquake on the conservative right since I came into it. The first thing that I, uh, looking with the eyes of a leftist, recent leftist, at at the conservative side, I said, "Where's the army?" Where's the ground war? Where's the SDS? Where's the moveon.org? Where, 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 where are the unions? All these forces for communism on the left pushed, that have pushed the Democratic Party from the McGovern days. It started with McGovern. It took 40 years, but have taken over that party. And there was none. And it's not like five years ago where you couldn't find three conservatives agreeing to march on Washington because they look at each other and say, what are we, collectivists? <laughs> uh, that, that, that's what they would say. And now there have been 100,000. The Tea Party is the earthquake. You would not have a Cruz standing up and saying, no, we are not signing on to this without the Tea Party. And the best thing that all Republicans can do is just stop the fratricide right now. Let the primary voters decide. You have any belief in this system as a democracy, you have to believe in the grassroots that it will, it's going to make mistakes. Everybody in politics makes mistakes. Um, I do think personally that candidates should be vetted just so that we don't get loons like Christine O'Donnell uh, being supported by by the party. Um, But to me, there should be a committee of two to vet candidates. And candidates would have to get all the money that candidates, Republican candidates get once they're elected in a primary unless the two of them, both of them, unanimously say no. And those two, I picked symbolic figures, would be Ted Cruz and Karl Rove. That's the way forward. And the, the final thing I have to say is we cannot beat the left. Remember Whitaker Chambers in the preface to Witness said, I am leaving the winning side for the losing side. Why are we going to lose, he said? Because communists have an idea they're willing to die for, and we don't. We do have that idea, and that idea is freedom. 
Everything that Obama is and the left is doing is a threat to individual freedom. Do not talk about Obamacare and the debt as though they're accounting problems. What they are are daggers aimed at the youth of this country. It's a war on the young. Because of Obama, first of all, Obamacare is taxing young and healthy people. That's what it's about. Heavy taxes on them. To fund people who are at the end of their lives and, you know, who have abused themselves, maybe, maybe they've just been unfortunate. We can find a way to help them. But we don't have to do it by punishing the young, by having them graduate from college with $100,000 debts, with running up trillions of dollars in deficits that they're going to have to pay. What does that mean? It means another day of indentured servitude. Taxes are a form of indentured servitude. You work for the government instead of yourself. And what Obama has done and what the Democratic Party is dedicated to doing is increasing the days when you are a servant of the state and not free. And that has to be the Republican rallying cry. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. Well, we do have some time for questions from the audience. If you could identify yourself with any uh, organization that you're with. So, and there's a microphone that'll go on. Thank you for a uh, depressing but uh, stirring conference, uh, presentation. My name is Dr. Sebastian Gorker. I'm with the FDD Foundation for Defense of Democracies. My father was put in prison for life by the communists, so I can uh, relate to what you're talking about. And I like this idea that they lost in the 1960s, but they've won uh, through stealth since then. From your presentation, it seems clear that we are in a very small minority in terms of understanding the deep story. There may be people who are disturbed, getting thrown off their health care and everything else, but to understand the back story to where we are today, there's very few of us. Given your reputation and what you've accomplished and the ten volumes of articles, it would seem very lacking in strategy to attack those on your own side. Can you talk about why you've taken somebody who's written what I think, as a PhD who teaches at university, a historically important book, such as The Betrayal of America, and divided the right yet again. If you had issues with Diana West's technical expertise, then take it to task on that. But ad hominem attacks that destroy the unity of our camp will not make us stronger in 2016. Okay. So I'm very curious for the motivation. Uh, Thank okay. you. For people who are not aware of the sequence of events, um, I, I, have, uh, I have several Websites. One of them is Front Page Magazine. It's edited by Jamie Glazo. I'm a very busy person, as you're writing the million words. So I don't, I don't, I actually don't monitor Front Page. And I have been on many college campuses where I've been confronted. And uh, you, you published this article. I was not even aware that the article appeared. An article appeared. It was a review of Diana West's book, American Betrayal. Um, and it was a, a uh, it was an endorsement, and I knew that that was a, an, it was going to be read whatever I said or anything as an endorsement from me. Um, and I looked at the book. I mean, uh, actually, Ron Radosh called me and alerted me that the review had appeared. So I got the book off Kindle and I, I began reading it. Um, and in my judgment, it is a very very bad and book, and it's a, I see it as a threat to everything that I've done and that Ray Dush has done and that Harvey Clare and John Earl Haynes and all of the conservatives who have dredged up uh, and, uh, the information from the archives about communist influence. Um, but I don't attack people on the right. I removed the review, and I had Jamie contact Diana, who is here with us today, and uh, instructed him to tell her that, we, you know, we were removing the review that we had run. 
I talked to the, re- the person who reviewed it. it he, this book is um, a complete reinterpretation of the Second World War uh, based on the presence of Soviet agents and, and communists uh, in the Roosevelt and, you know, sympathizers, fellow travelers in the Roosevelt administration. Um, uh, and to inform Diana that we would run, that we're going to run, I, I removed the review because I didn't want to be seen as endorsing it, uh, the book. And we were going to run another review, and that if she, had, if she needed to reply, if she felt that it merited a reply, she could have as much space as she required, as she wanted, to respond to it. And I actually had in mind, but I, something told me I better wait to see her reaction, of inviting her to my restoration weekend and having her because I already knew I was going to ask Radosh to review it, to debate Radosh. I'm, I'm a, a great believer in intellectual debate and dialogue. Um, for Just for removing that, re- for, she rejected the offer um, and went on the attack. She called me a totalitarian. She's called me a, a, a commissar, a book burner. Um, so if you have a problem with this, so-called war, the war is all coming from her end. I have done nothing except I, I wrote two replies um, because I was a personally under attack, explaining what I've explained here. Um, so I think it's a very, very bad book. And the reason I think it's a bad book, uh, and I'm just to give an example, uh, one of the chapters starts out, was D-Day a Soviet plot? Uh, instead of saying, I think Soviet uh, D-Day was a Soviet, the whole chapter is designed to prove it. But the way she proves it is by, you know, she talks about how Hollywood is pro-Soviet. She talks about a general who was upset that we didn't follow Churchill's plan through the Vulcans. In my view, the way to approach that, that kind of question of whether it was a Soviet, first of all, you have to identify the specific Soviet agents that made the D-Day decision. Otherwise, what you, you have Eisenhower, you have the general, you, you're impugning the loyalty and integrity of the whole general staff. Then you have to analyze the military forces involved. What were the military arguments for not going up through the Balkans, but for going through France, so forth and so on. The book doesn't do that. She keeps waving, there's 500 Soviet agents in Washington. Well, how many people were there. You know, how many bureaucrats, how many officials were in Washington? If it's tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, I don't know. You really have to be very specific. She, she claims that Harry Hopkins was a Soviet agent, an actual agent, Agent 19. You know, there's a controversy. Stan Evans is also here. There's a controversy over that, but it's pretty clear. Uh, you know, and I'm not an expert in this field. But it's been pretty clearly established that Lawrence Duggan was Agent 19. Uh, But that's not, it's just sloppiness, intellectual sloppiness across the whole book that caused me, I mean, I I, I actually didn't intend to launch a campaign again, to write, uh, to remove the favorable review that that Mark wrote. Because, you know, when I talked to him, he said, I don't really know anything about the Second World War. I thought we were just promoting a conservative book. It embarrasses me to admit this about my magazine, that my editor and one of my writers could think that we abandon our responsibilities for establishing standards over a book. But I, I can understand that. As, a, as an author, I will tell you, uh, when I uh, revealed, uh, we wrote an article, Peter Collier and I, for the, we were number one best-selling authors in 1985, top of the New York Times list, front page of the New York Times. And the Washington Post called us, uh, called me to pick my brains about Joe Kennedy Jr. And uh, at the end of the interview, he said, uh, what are you guys up to? I said, you won't believe this. We just voted for Ronald Reagan. Oh, that's a good story. <laughs> so we wrote, left these, actually our title was Better Ron Than, Better Ron than Red. But they called it Lefties, <laughs> Lefties for Reagan. Um, and when that appeared on the front page of the Washington Post magazine, the Sunday magazine, 
Peter Collier said to me, our literary careers are over. And I'm a, I'm a cockeyed optimist. I'm like, what are you talking about? Absolutely true. Absolutely true. I, I don't, I, my, my, my books are not reviewed anymore, and not reviewed it certainly in the New York Times. I, I was called a relic by Noah Feldman, an apologist for the Islamo-fascists at Harvard, in, in a little squib on one of the books. But that's the only mention that I've gotten, wiped out. So I am in the business of promoting conservative books. I think conservatives put an enormous amount of intellectual energy into the books they write. The conservative press is not good about seeing that conservative books get reviewed. And so, you know, I have Jamie interview the authors, and I'm, I'm, I'm lax in that area. I'm just trying to redress a terrible imbalance. And I, I regret that this, I mean, I might, you know, people kept saying to me, stop this fratricide. So I stopped writing. I mean, Diana keeps publishing stuff. She, she's got a whole book. It's 22,000 words. It's called Book Burners. That's me and Radosh. For one bad review. Come on. <laughs> yes. Oh, you should, you should call out people. Yes, what? Hi, Rob. Yeah, uh, uh, microphone's uh, coming. Red card? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Wes Vernon, I now write for RenewAmerica.com. Uh, I remember reading Shadow Party 15, 20 years ago, and you outlined a plan whereby Soros, whom you referred to a few minutes back, uh, is hoping to bring about a second constitutional convention by the year 2020. Well, then it was about two decades in, in the future. Now it's seven years. And I'm wondering, where is that going? And what, if anybody, what, if anything, or anybody is doing to try to head it off? James I think it's a very good question. I can't answer it because I, I, I didn't like even writing about Soros. I mean, I did it because it had to be done. So I haven't paid attention uh, since then. And I'm always very wary when conservatives propose constitutional conventions and amendments. Don't mess with the document. Mm. You know, it's the only anchor that we have, and it's being shredded to mix some kind of metaphor as we speak <coughs> by the Democrats. But I, I think that somebody should be on Soros in particular. We don't have a Soros to the right. That's one of the big, big problems. He's got the Democracy Alliance of $50 million a year that he spreads I, I, uh, around left-wing organizations. I, I did a book with Jacob Laxon called The New Leviathan, which shows that in the area where Heritage is operating, in the policy area, in the 501c3 advocacy area, on the environment, on foreign policy, and so forth, the right is outfunded 10 to 1. Minimum. That's not counting the universities, which are all left-wing think tanks, 10 to 1. So the, the, the right isn't going to stand. Oh, I'm, I'm, he, he's supposed to do it. So, sorry. Hi, David. My name is Peter Husey. Um, for the record, Diane mentions my grandfather twice in her book. His name was Helmut von Moltke, the leader of the July plot to kill Adolf Hitler. Uh, he was arrested prior to that in January and tortured and executed. When he was in Turkey and met with American military forces, he said the whole idea was to go through the Balkans and do Normandy, to do both, which would pincer the Nazis, but it would get, as he said to George Kennan before the world, before the war, if the Russians get, if there's a war and they get to Berlin before you do, they will own all of Eastern Europe. And he said, that you never want to see happen. Just, just for the record, I think, to be fair. fair. My question to you involves Islamist threats we face and the states that run with them, because it is not just individuals, but states. I often hear that most Muslims are perfectly fine people, but it's the radicals. You've seen that from this administration. And that the, they call them fanatics or whatever they want, in the world we face with communism, a lot of people who are Marxists, who call themselves communists, didn't run concentration camps or have designs to blow the world. 
Is there an analogy between what we've had to fight during the entire Cold War with what we're having to fight now? It's no less dangerous. In fact, these guys want to die as the others didn't. You know, could you address that issue? Yeah. I'm a Jew. When there's a, a Muslim leader who stands up and denounces Karadawi, the spiritual leader of not only of the Muslim Brotherhood, but the spiritual advisor of Huma Abedin, a Muslim Brotherhood operator, operative who is Hillary's right hand, when there are moderate, when there are Muslims that will stand up and defend the right of Jews to live, I'll be impressed by the fact that this is only a small bunch of radicals. I, I see government all over the Middle East with leaders who are calling for the extermination for the Jews. I don't see one Muslim government leader was denouncing that. I don't see that many Europeans doing it either. So, <laughs> I think this is much worse than than we faced. This is the worst threat we have ever faced. Sure, sure. Sam. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. I agree with almost every word you said in your speech until you started in our Dino West book which was not a part of your speech. It was an answer to Sebastian's question. Let me just say this. Uh, I have studied these documents pretty carefully. I think her analysis of what happened in World War II under Roosevelt is pretty darn accurate. And there's no time to expand on that here. But let me pick up one thing that I want to punctuate with and then ask you a question, if I may. You mentioned the case of Harry Hopkins. I got embroiled in a controversy over this myself, and I won't go into the details. The controversy over Harry Hopkins is not precipitated by Diana West. All she was doing was citing the work of Herbert Romerstein, who was an absolute expert on this matter, and he was basing his comments on what Akmerov, the leading illegal in the United States, uh, said in a speech reported by Oleg Gordievsky, whom Herb knew, who said that during World War II, Hopkins was the principal Soviet agent in the American government. That could be right or wrong. Uh, Herb thought it was right. He said it was conclusive. Diana simply cited that. Secondly, the question, and my question is based on this. You mentioned the numerical factors of there were only 500 or I think there were more than that but say there were 500 of these Soviet agents communists, fellow travelers in the government versus tens of thousands of employees that is not the issue the issue is where were they situated That's right. and I wrote a piece in response to you and Ron that I think you may have seen called In Defense of Dinah West and I went into the question of who these agents were and where they were located. His, in the State Department, the principal American operative who knew what he was doing at Yalta, which is a chapter in a book that Herb and I did a year ago. Lachlan Curry in the White House. Harry Dexter White at the Treasury, orchestrating all kinds of policy initiatives to aid the Soviet Union, uh, and the records show that very clearly. Did you read my rebuttal? And if so, please tell me what you thought of it. Okay. I, I, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but let me just say this. Look, um, the big deal about Yalta was the division of Europe, right? Giving Stalin 70% influence. Also China. Okay, but let, let's I, – I don't want to get into a historical – Thing. I just, I, I just want to show what I think is wrong with the book and with your defense of it. So Yalta, um, the, the crime of Yalta was to have delivered Eastern Europe to Stalin. As it happens, it was Churchill who made that agreement. Yes, this famous piece of paper in which Churchill wrote, met with Stalin, wrote it down. So you have to argue that either Churchill was a Soviet stooge um, or 
there were other – there were more complicated factors involved. And then you analyze the factors and you – okay. But this is what the book doesn't do and it's why I disagreed with it. I don't want to – it's interesting. I mean I, I wouldn't think of sending a little army to uh, Diana West's uh, book <laughs> presentation to uh, attack her. Um, but for just of those, you heard my talk. What Diana West has accused me of is suppressing the word she uses. Her book, because I don't want people to know the communist influence in American government. Now, you heard my talk. This is lunacy. And she should be ashamed of herself for making that kind of attack. And that's the kind of attack that's really destructive. If it was an intellectual issue, fine. You know, somebody in Washington, I mean, I have my platforms all the time. I have debates. I have, I have Zudi Yasser and Robert Spencer debating whether there are moderate Muslims or not. Uh, you know, somebody in Washington can hold a, a platform and let's get the intellectual argument out there. Radosh lives here. He'd be happy, I'm sure, to be on the platform. And let, you know, let it be argued out and people can listen. So, anyway, I'll, I'll, I can't say I'm going to, afterwards I gotta, I'm getting I'm interviewed, so I, I can't be around to continue this debate. But go, I'm sorry. I, keep t- I, I agree. I think, I think David makes a, makes a good point. So um, I see two more hands here. Let's take those questions. And then uh, we're already past an hour, so I want to be respectful of time. Yes, sir. Doug Brooks, uh, am I allowed to make a non-Diana West question? <laughs> <laughs> My question is about Christopher Hitchens and where you fit him into sort of the, the history of conservatism. Uh, One of the best pieces I think I've ever written is called The Two Christophers. And it, it appears in my book, Radicals. But you can, you can easily... David, David. just the I'm online viewer. Oh, right. I'm, I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, one of the best things, from my point of view, that I've, I've written is called The Two Christophers. And... <clears throat> um, you can find it on the web, but it's also the first chapter in my book called Radicals. Um, Christopher died a leftist. He was a leftist. He, he, he did some heroic things. On the, well, he did some really good things vis-a-vis the Clintons and Sidney uh, Blumenthal. But um, – and I, I, I just had no sympathy for and could not understand – well, I, I understand from his point of view his crusade against religious people. It was – he had a lot of things that, that were not really uh, pleasant, um, although he was a very pleasant human being. I mean he was a great entertainment and a, a very gracious in person. Um, Christopher opposed the Iraq war because he opposed Islamofascism. It was his anti-religion that, that did that. And he was also, he was a kind of a character. He, he liked to eat his cake and have it. Um, that's why the two Christophers, and he himself, I mean, I quote in his memoir, he describes his, his icon is uh, Janus, which is the Roman god of doorways, and it faces in two directions. Now, Christopher, uh, you know, his, his enemies on the left, with some justice, you know, he was an opportunist. He liked to eat his cake and have it too. So he was friends uh, with Wolfowitz, and you know, he did things like that. It's, it's one of the things that made him a really interesting character. You'd always want to have him around. He, he made the conversation, but in his heart, he was a leftist. He was a Trotskyite. That's what he thought of himself as. He thought that Deutsch's volumes on Trotsky were. You know, Deutscher was my mentor when I was on the left. Uh, that was the cat's meow. Deutscher was wrong, profoundly wrong about the, the most important things. He believed that they, uh, well, I don't know if going, like Deutscher was wrong, but it was very, imp- well, it's important. He believed there was a socialist foundation in Russia and that that would assert itself and create a democracy. Socialism is a very bad idea that doesn't work. There's no, there's no socialist economy that's going to make people better off. It makes them worse off. It generalizes poverty. Yeah, but one of the, let me do, when I came into the right, I mean, you have to understand, I was in my mid 30s when I lost my leftist faith, and I'm, I have four kids. 
what the heck am I going to do? How am I going to earn a living? I mean, I'm a professional leftist. Um, and that's all I wrote about, of course, was the socialist future and the, you know, and the, the struggles. Um, and then I said, aha, I'll write about socialism. And then somebody gave me von Mises' book written in 1922 that shows why the damn thing will not work. And so I had to whatever and reinvent myself some way. Anyway, so Randy, final question. Uh, final question, non Diana West question. Um, you you launched you recently made headlines by launching launching the website Truth Truth Revolt. Talk about your effort and what how that project is going. And you had this curious boycott of Ritz crackers, which I found interesting. <laughs> talk talk about how much effort. Re, I mean, what the success has been of that. Is Ben here? Yeah, right. Yeah, there's the founder of Truth Revolt. What I did was I invested in this brilliant young man. That That's it. He, you want to do it in a, a quick little answer to that, Ben? Andrew can give you the mic. Okay. No, go on. Go, come on. Okay, come on up, Ben. <laughs> I feel like Andrew going to Andrew Wiener's press conference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, now I'm going to... Ask David for his cell phone pictures. But um, the, uh, I mean, the purpose of Truth Revolt was, was very clear. It was supposed to be mutually assured destruction against Media Matters. Media Matters is the left-wing uh, Hillary Clinton launch organization that is specifically designed to silence folks on the right. And what our job was to do was to establish that folks in the media uh, on the left are, are, in fact, on the left, uh, to not only keep tabs on them, um, but to make people aware of who exactly was funding this project. As far as the, the boycott of Ritz crackers, while we never explicitly called for a boycott, we called for people to make their voices known to Ritz that they were unhappy that Ritz was supporting Al Sharpton, who is in fact a racist and a race baiter, um, and, uh, and is the greatest blot and, uh, and signal to the mainstream media that the mainstream media is in fact radically left. No, nobody on the mainstream left should except Al Sharpton. They all do. That's a good example of everything that, that David has been saying for so long with regards to their motivations, their actual attitude. Uh, with regard to what our goals are with Ritz, Ritz has been completely silent. Uh, they're a multi-billion dollar corporation, which is not particularly surprising. Mondelez International owns them. Um, but they're certainly not the only target there, and we have uh, an action group of over a 1,000 people who have signed up uh, to make their voices heard with regard to not only advertisers but also to sponsors uh, of various uh, leftist projects around the country, uh, including in the university system as well as in the media. There are people on the right who are uncomfortable with this. There are people on the right who think – uh, that this is that this is nasty and underhanded. Uh, the fact is, it's the only way to fight back against the left. And until the left understands that there are consequences to the kind of tactics that it's been using against the right, they're going to continue to bully and to oppress folks on the right for expressing their viewpoints. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, please join me in thanking David Horowitz for being with us today. You're able to purchase a copy of his book uh, in the hallway as you leave.